We've had a lot of requests from people asking us to check out some new Z890 ITX boards. This is the first one that we're going to check out. This is the Gigabyte Z890i Aorus Ultra. But as usual with our motherboard content, ladies and gents, this video is not a review. It's just an overview so we can take a bit of a closer look at what comes in the box of this brand new board and what's physically on this new board. Let's dive in and take a look. All right, here it is, ladies and gents, the Gigabyte Z890i Aorus Ultra. Let's get that motherboard out of the way so we can take a bit of a closer look at everything that comes with this brand new Intel Core Ultra Series motherboard. First of all, we've got this bit of documentation. This one I found a bit interesting. This has every single Z890 board on it, just in case you were interested, as well as the rest of the documentation. There's a bunch of stickers and all that jazz, as you'd usually find with the motherboard. Then there's a set of SATA or SATA cables for your 2.5 inch SSDs or those good old spinning rust drives. There's also these. These are breakout cables for the PWM headers on the motherboard. This is basically to save surface space on the PCB of the motherboard itself. There's also this single M.2 screw. There is a single M.2 slot on the back side of the motherboard, which we'll come back to in a moment, as well as these two screws here. These are to screw the motherboard into your case and it has two different thread types. As well as that, we've got the antenna for the built-in Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi 7. It also uses a new connector that Gigabyte's made for these new generations of motherboards. Okay, let's unsheath the Z890i Aorus Ultra and take a bit of a closer look at everything on the board. Along the right-hand edge of the board, we've got a USB Type-C front panel header. This is 10 gigabit USB Type-C. There's also the front panel connector for your lights and all your switches. We have a TPM header. We've got a USB 2.0 header. We also have a USB Type-A 3.2 header. There's two SATA or SATA ports for your 2.5 inch SSDs or your spinning rust drives. And last but not least, there's a 24 pin power connector to send juice to your brand new motherboard. Along the top edge of the board, well more specifically the top right hand edge of the board, we have some debug LEDs. This is like a postcode readout in case there's something happening with your system booting. There's also two of those PWM headers that those breakout cables are for. There's two 3-pin 5-volt addressable RGB headers and then a single full PWM fan header. Lastly, there's an 8-pin EPS power connector to send juice to your brand new CPU. The final header on the board is the front panel audio header and that is just above the top PCIe slot. Speaking of PCIe, this has a single PCIe Gen 5 by 16 slot. Because this is an ITX board, it's never gonna have more than a single PCIe slot. However, one really interesting thing about this slot is this is the first ITX board that I've seen with a button to release the top slot. I think this is a very important move for Gigabyte and it's good to see that they've added this to the board. In terms of the VRM layout, this features a digital eight plus one plus two phase VRM layout with 105 amp power stages with a 10 layer PCB. As you can see here, basically the whole top of the IO cover is a heat sink. There's a heat sink at the top of the board and then there are heat pipes that connect all three heat sinks together. That's right, I said three because the heat pipes connect up to the M.2 heat sink and the chipset heat sink. In terms of the cooler mounting here, this is the same as you'll find with LGA 1700. We'll come back to this in another video. But let's pop open that brand new LGA 1851 socket just in case you haven't seen inside this socket before. Because if you're not well versed with LGA 1700, which is Intel's previous socket, the main thing you'll notice here is there's more pins towards the left hand side of the socket. If we flip the board over, you can see that it's got a back plate for the socket itself, well for the ILM, as well as an M.2 slot, which we'll come back to in a moment. As for RAM compatibility, it's got two DDR5 DIMM slots, which support up to a total of 128 gigs of RAM total, running at 8,800 mega transfers. As mentioned, there's two M.2 slots on this board. The top slot, which is the one I'm opening here with a spring-loaded clip, is a single PCIe Gen 5 M.2 slot. And as mentioned, this slot is cooled by the heat pipe that connects up to the VRM heatsink as well. 
However, if we flip the board over to the back side, there is another M.2 slot. This is a PCIe Gen 4x4 M.2 slot. So two M.2 slots in total. Lastly, for rear I.O., we've got a DisplayPort 2.1 port, an HDMI 2.1 port. We've got USB 3.2 Gen 1, which is typically 5 gigabit. We've got a single Thunderbolt 4 port, which is also USB 4. There's a Q flash button in case you wanted to update the BIOS. There's four more USB type A ports. There's 2.5 gigabit ethernet. There's that quick release, easy antenna connector for the built-in Wi-Fi 7 and the Bluetooth and a line out jack, a microphone jack and optical slash SPDIF output with the Realtek audio codec. time of filming this video the whole platform from Intel is not even out yet so we can't do anything other than show you the board for now but the reason why I wanted to show you guys this nice and early is because we've been getting people asking us about what ITX is going to look like with Intel's new platform and this was the first ITX board that arrived first cab off the rank what do I think about this board though after taking a pretty close look at it well it does a few things that are pretty interesting. First of all, it bears a striking resemblance to the Z490 Aorus Ultra that we saw, I think that was 10th gen. So yeah, it looks, it looks very similar to the design of that, which isn't terrible. It also does away with the PWM fan headers that most other motherboards have. I've said this in the past, I'm still not quite sure how I feel about the fact that it's only got a single PWM fan header and those breakout cables, but I guess that's to save space on the PCB. I know I sound like I'm repeating myself from other generations with this kind of stuff, but yeah, I just don't know why they couldn't just put regular PWM headers considering the connectors for the breakout cables are exactly the same size as a PWM fan header. I don't think you'd be saving that much PCB space. Even looking at the through-hole connectors and where it is on the PCB, it almost looks like it's the same width anyway, so just give us PWM fan headers, guys. Come on. It's a bit silly. We're past this. Anyway, other than that, it does one thing that I haven't seen any other ITX board do, and that is, ladies and gents, have a quick release button on the PCIe slot. Sure, the ASUS X870 ITX board had a spring-loaded clip, but it doesn't have a button. I think that's cool. And I mean, if they can add the button, surely they can add two PWM fan headers, right? <laughs> Sorry, I just thought I'd have a dig because it is a bit strange that they continue to do this. And I mean, it doesn't really make a difference, I suppose. Anyway, in terms of what I can tell for VRM cooling and chipset cooling, this is a pretty nice design. It's got a heat pipe that wraps all the way around from the top heat sink through the I.O. cover and the heat pipe continues on to be a chipset and M.2 cooler. That is a very, very nice, clever design. So in terms of the way this is looking, like I said, it's like the Z490i Aorus Ultra. And I think they're onto something here with this design. It is definitely one of the better looking ITX boards, especially for these new Intel CPUs that we're gonna be seeing very, very shortly. Now, other than that, it's, it's standard ITX stuff because if you're interested in this board when it launches, you're going to be looking at spending around 349 US dollars or around about 669 Aussie dollars when it launches. In comparison to what we saw with other ITX boards from this generation, so that means with the Ryzen stuff as well, for a high-end ITX board, it's a lot cheaper than what we've seen from, let's say, Asus with that X870 board. And I know you can't really compare them considering they're two different platforms, but I think this is more in line with 
the pricing that we should be seeing, especially in Australia, given cost of living, inflation and all that stuff. Let's be realistic here, guys. If we were looking at an ITX board five years ago with this feature set, well, in comparison to, I think in Aussie dollars at least, this is about $200 more than it would have been, but beggars can't be choosers, guys. If you're gonna go small, you gotta pay more. And that's the bottom line.